Well, good morning, Mercy Church. Excited to be with you this morning. I want to invite you to stand as we sing this old song together. Blessed assurance. Blessed assurance. Jesus is mine. Yes, he is. And oh, what a foretaste of glory. Church. Well, as we continue to worship, let's spend a moment in fellowship. I uh, 
uh, I had a pastor, an old fellow, he called this part the shake and howdy. So uh, turn to your neighbor, shake their hand, tell them howdy. I'm glad you came to worship today. And we'll continue singing in just a minute. you sometime come up to me after the service i heard howdy back there i love that um <laughs> as we continue to worship this morning i wanted to draw our eyes to the scriptures here this is romans chapter 5 starting at verse 1 says this therefore since we have been declared righteous by faith we have peace with god through our lord jesus christ we have also obtained access through him by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of god and not only that, but we also, listen to this, we rejoice in our afflictions because we know that affliction produces endurance. Endurance produces proven character and proven character produces hope. This hope will not disappoint us because God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has given to us. Man, what a mighty word for us this morning. As we continue, let's lift our voices together and worship Mercy Church, knowing that through faith we have peace with God and stand firm in his grace. No matter what trials and challenges we're facing this morning, no matter what trial or hardship looms large on your horizon, let's rejoice in the assurance that our suffering produces perseverance and character and hope. That's the blessed assurance that we just sang about, that our suffering is not meaningless, it's not worthless, it's not in vain, but rather our suffering is doing something for us. It's producing for us an eternal weight of glory. This is the goodness of God. Amen? Amen. Let's behold him together this morning. He who was before there was light walked across the pages of time he who made every living thing behold him he who heard humanity's cry left his throne to wake as a child he became like the least of behold him Jesus, Son of God, Messiah.
join with the chorus in heaven to sing his words. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Worthy, worthy, worthy to receive all praise. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Worthy, worthy, worthy to Yeah, praise God. Praise God, Mercy Church. It is such a joy to hear you sing those words. What a blessing it is to be in the house of the Lord this morning. I'm Jake. I'm one of the pastors here, if I've never met you before. And as we continue in our worship service, I want to just pause for a minute to tell you about a couple next steps that might be what the Lord has for you next in your discipleship journey. Here at Mercy, we want to help you take your next step in following Jesus. And so I would just encourage you to just tune your ears to the Lord for the next few minutes to see if maybe there's something that he's going to ask you to invite you into in these next uh, moments. So first off, I want to speak to you if you are new to Mercy Church in the room, and we're so glad that you are here. We know it's a big deal to check out a new church, and we've made your first next step really simple for you. We've got an area right outside. You walked right by when you came in here called our next step area. There's some friendly people out there that would love to meet you, know your name, and get just a little bit of information from you. And actually, we have a gift that we'd like to give you as just a thank you for being here and for checking out this church. And maybe you've been around a while and you're not really sure what your next step is. Well, that area is also for you as well. So you can stop by there as well. Now, secondly, I want to speak to you in the room. If maybe you you would look at Mercy Church. Mercy Church is my church. My mic is going out. Hold it up higher. I got it. Yeah, it We're going to go like this then. Okay. <laughs> Hey, if you're in the room and you would call this your church and, and, and this is your home, but you do not yet regularly give of your money to this church, man, I want to just encourage you for a minute that giving of our money is one of the ways that we can obey and one of the ways that we can trust in God. I know for me, when I first, in my, in my spiritual formational journey, when I first started taking the step of giving of my money, I was scared. I was nervous that maybe there wasn't going to be enough money left over for the other things in my life. And it was a big step for me. But here's what I want to encourage you with. The Lord met me right there. And I didn't feel any judgment from him. And he's going to meet you right wherever you are in your journey. And I want to encourage you to just consider maybe taking that step. I want to invite you to obey and to trust the Lord. When we give of our resources to gospel work in, in, in this world, we trust God with, our, with the resources that he's entrusted to us. We are actively obeying his call to be good stewards. 
And when we take that step of faith, we grow in our faith and trust as we believe in the God of promises who has told us that he's going to provide for every one of our needs. So maybe that's you this morning, and we've made it very easy for you to begin that journey today. If you'd like to do it, if you've got any questions, we'd be more than happy to help you take that step. Lastly, for everybody in the room, we are one church that gathers in three locations on a Sunday morning. We've got campuses spread around the Charlotte area. And this is a strategy that we believe is a faithful way to engage more people in this great city of Charlotte and the area around it, ultimately with the hope of making more disciples who love God, love each other, and love our world. And we've seen the Lord's favor over this strategy. But from time to time, we want to gather our whole church together. And so I'm excited to tell you this morning that on September 22nd at 1030 a.m., we're going to have a gathering where we're going to gather as one church in one location for one service. And I want you to be getting hype about that. I want you to be excited about it. But really, your, your action step, this is the easiest next step of the whole morning. It's just to save the date. Just mark down the, on your calendar. You're going to want to be here for this. September 22nd, 1030 at Ovens Auditorium here in Charlotte. We're going to gather as one church, and it's going to be amazing. So let's be expecting on God to move in our church between now and then. You'll hear more about that in the days to come, so just save the day for now. Now, as we continue in our worship service by sitting under the teaching of God's word, I want to encourage you to grab a seat and turn your attention to the screen. Hey, good morning, Mercy family. Good morning, guys. Uh, it's August. This is crazy. Hey, I want to stop and just say thank you so much uh, for the way you encouraged our guest preachers and our staff preachers during the month of July. That's normally when I take a month off for praying, for planning, spending some time with family, and just dreaming for what God has next for Mercy Church. In fact, this year I was even able to, last week, I got a chance to uh, kind of fill in for my best pastor friend in Charlotte. It's a guy named Alex Kennedy over at Carmel. Baptist. He had to be out. He needed a hand. And because we have such great uh, preachers here, I was able to go over and help him out. So I just want to say thank you uh, for your encouragement of all of them. And July was awesome, but I am ready to get after it. And this sermon is, uh, well, it's full. We got a lot we're going to do. If you are newer with Mercy, uh, my name's Spence. I serve as a lead pastor here. Um, and I want to talk to you, if you're new, for just a second. As you just heard Pastor Jake say, we're one church. We meet in three locations. And we believe God is moving in this area, and he's putting us on really a simple, I mean, it's easy, but a simple mission, man, to proclaim the good news of the hope of Jesus Christ and to help people take their next steps in following him. So wherever you are with Jesus, we believe God has a next step for you. If you have come in today at the invite of a friend or family, and you're kind of skeptical or just investigating, we believe God has a next step for you, and we're really glad you're here, right? If you have been away from church for a long time and you're starting to work your way back, we believe God has a next step for you and we're really glad that you are here. If you're just new to Charlotte and you're trying to, you're like, man, I can't buy a house because they're all taken. And um, yeah, you're like, and the roads are all clogged. Well, 120 people move to Charlotte every single day. So welcome. Everybody else is new too, but we're glad you're here and you have a next step. All right. Wherever you are, uh, the fact that you're here, we are thankful to the Lord for it. And we believe God has a next step for you. And the best thing, man, the best thing for you is to trust the Lord, take those next steps. Uh, and we believe that you will flourish and the church will flourish when we do that together. So here's the deal. Right after service, we have something we call starting point. We only do it once a month. It's a 20-minute orientation to who we are as a church led by our pastors and staff. We're trying to help you figure out, is this the church for you? We want to be the church for anybody, but we know we're not the church for everybody. But you need a church home, all right? We believe that. Way, I believe it way down in my core, all right? Now, now, so what I'll say is, you should check that out, see if this is the church for you. But here's the deal. It usually takes about four to six weeks to figure out if a church is for you, all right? You'll know in the first five minutes if it's definitely not, okay? But you're still here. So you made it past 
that part, all right? Uh, since you're still here, I would tell you, take the next four to six weeks and kind of lock in with us, like up through Labor Day. You got enough change going on in your life, right? If you're a student, maybe you're going back into school, maybe you've got kids that are doing that, maybe your adult kickball league is getting started up, and so you just got a lot of changes in your schedule right now. Make it normative, just be here on Sundays, because in those Sundays, to transition to our sermon, we're going to be in the book of Exodus, and we are going to be just going through kind of a theme of walking with God through the wilderness, and it's going to be awesome. The big idea I want to get across during our time in Exodus these next several weeks is that the wilderness is God's workshop. The wilderness is God's workshop. When you get stripped of your normal patterns and rhythms because of maybe it's a, a life change, a situation change, a relationship change, whatever, I want you to see if you open your mind and your hearts to it, that season of will, that feels like wilderness is also God's workshop where he's going to do great work in your life. And I'm not just talking about repair work. I'm talking about soul strengthening work. Because look, here's the way, I think it's subconscious, but we often treat spiritual growth like it's just kind of a steady up into the right line. Like I'm going to try and grow two spiritual growth units this year or something like that. I don't know what we think they are. But we tend to think that way. But that's just not how spiritual growth works. Spiritual growth happens based on our receptivity to God and our dependence on him. All right? When we depend on him, that's when he grows us and strengthens us. And man, in times of wilderness, we can experience immense growth in Christ because we're dependent and open dependent on him, open to him, unlike we are in those normal rhythms. The wilderness is God's workshop. It's for sure his workshop in Israel, or for Israel. My goodness, we're going to see him, we're going to see God over Exodus 12 through 19 is kind of the ground that we're covering. We're in 14 today. We're going to see him part the Red Sea. We're going to see him purify water. We're going to, uh, with a tree, we're going to see him bring water from a rock. We're going to see him save Israel two different times from massive armies, and we're going to see him bless them with a daily delivery of a Chick-fil-A combo meal right to their doorstep. It's going to be amazing what he's going to do. The things that God does for his people, recorded in Exodus 12 through 19, they are referenced, get this, the rest of the Bible, the rest of the Bible keeps going back to what we're about to go through as evidence, as reassurance, as conviction, as promise that God is faithful to his promises to his people. He's faithful, y'all. And here's the thing. All right. Despite all these amazing things we're going to see God do, Israel's going to struggle. They're going to struggle. And in Israel, we're going to see a people that just waffle back and forth between God is awesome. I believe in him. I'm right there with him. Whatever you want me to do, God. And then the next minute, are you even real? Are you even here, God? Yes, I'm with you, God. God, are you there? Back and forth, back and forth. Can anybody relate to that? All right, that's faith and doubt in the wilderness. It's what makes this text so powerful for us. God's the hero. Moses is the agent that he uses. And Israel is the wishy-washy people that God loves and saves and forgives and blesses and strengthens for the days ahead. The wilderness is God's workshop. We'll definitely see it today. Today, we look at one of the most iconic and important moments in the whole Bible. Exodus 14 is where God parts the Red Sea and delivers his people through it on dry land. Even if you have like very little Bible knowledge, you probably at least heard that referenced before. We're actually going to look at this again next week because chapter 15, Moses looks back on it. Moses is our author. Chapter 14, he tells us what happens. We'll see that today. Chapter 15, he kind of writes a little song and reflects on what happens. We'll see that next week. So we're going to get into it. We're going to watch God deliver Israel through the Red Sea. And remember, we are watching the example, the New Testament says, the example, the demonstration of how God saves his people and assurance that God will save his people. So as we go through it, today I'm just going to kind of show you a few important truths of the Christian faith. Like these are basics, all right? One's going to be about God's faithful presence with you. One's going to be about true freedom God offers versus the false myths of freedom that are popular in our culture, because, man, are they prevalent and popular. And both of these are going to build to, as does Exodus, one big idea about the gospel I want to give you out front. This is where we're going today. Listen, God saves you. What you're going to see today is he saves you permanently and completely in one decisive act. He saves you permanently and completely 
in one decisive act. That's where we're going to arrive. And if you can get your heart and mind around that, you'll be ready to receive the work that God wants to do in the wilderness. All right? Exodus 14. If you're new to mercy, this is kind of how we do it week in, week out. We just open up a passage, work our way through it, see what God has for us. And we'll keep it pretty simple. We try to do that so you can do it at home on your own kind of the same way. All right? Exodus 14, verse 1. You ready? Yeah. All right. I uh, was preaching last week over at Carmel, and I kind of asked that question pretty often around here. You guys ready? And Craig and a couple others say yes. And then, um, but nobody. Everybody was like, what? Just kind of look at me with cock. I was like, oh, yeah. All that to say, it's good to be home. All right, here we go. Uh, verse 1. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, tell the Israelites to turn back and camp in front of Pihahirath. I had to practice that one. Between Migdal and the sea. You must camp in front of Baal Zephon, facing it by the sea. Pharaoh will say of the Israelites, they're wandering around the land in confusion. The wilderness has boxed them in. All right, because we've got these landmarks that sound weird, and you and I don't like know them, we'll be tempted to just move right past this as geographical t- context. But there's a really big point here. Think about this. God is telling the Israelites who are on the run, like you remember uh, the first part of Exodus, right? Exodus is all the plagues and stuff, and God delivers them out, and so they're leaving, and they're on the run, and what does God say to do? Turn back. Turn back? And not only turn back, but I want you to go park with your backs to the sea. All right, look, I don't know how many armies you have been in charge of. Um, I've been in charge of one paintball unit, and I've been a soldier in an airsoft unit, right? Um, The only thing I know is what you don't do is go into a place in the woods or the arena or wherever you are, you don't back yourself into a corner with no way out so the enemy can come and get you, right? That's bad military strategy, right? That's what God's telling them to do. And God even says, Pharaoh's going to think that you're lost. And I want to tell you something true about following the Lord right here. Following Jesus is often going to seem not just crazy to the world, but sometimes obedience to God seems downright backwards. Just backwards. Like take, for example, just the world's view on probably the three predominant gods of our world, right? Money, sex, and power. The world says, treat money as holy, be generous with sex, and use power to serve yourself. But then God says, treat sex as holy, Be generous with your money and use your power to exalt others and humble yourself. It's just backwards from the way the world thinks. And if you're waiting on following God to make sense to the world, you're wasting your time. So I want to ask you, and I want this kind of running in your mind today, what step is God calling you to, Christian? What step is he calling you to that might seem a little backwards to the world? Maybe it doesn't fit with the American dream of promotions and accomplishments and being the youngest, wealthiest, most bestest, best that ever bested, right? What's your next step? Because I want you to see, even if, especially if and when it's counterintuitive to the world, man, here's what I want you to see. What God calls you to, he will see you through. What he calls you to, he will see you through. Now, I know that that little phrase is a little cheesy sounding, okay? Like you'd find it on Granny's couch throw pillow. I get it. As I was writing it, I felt it, okay? But if we can get past that, the testimony of Israel right here is that that is absolutely true. What God calls you to, he will see you through. He put a warrior angel and a cloud representing his presence right here with Israel the whole time to be right there with them. Man, maybe, I mean, let's think of some examples of what God might be stirring in some of you. Some of you, maybe it's leaving a great salary and 401k and going into full-time ministry. Now, I'll never forget when I was at, um, for me, it was senior year, spring semester, senior year at UNC. I'm in UNC, Keenan Flagler Business School. I'm in the business school and I'm getting ready to graduate my degree and I'm like, "Uh, maybe I'm supposed to go into ministry and I'm uh, working through this. So I go to my advisor, right, over the business school and I don't have the guts to say ministry. So I go to my advisor and say, I'm thinking about nonprofit work. Um, can you, can you help? And she just looks at me like, why would you do that? And I was like, well, you know, just want to make an impact or something like that. And she's like, well, we're training you for mid-level and uh, mid-level management and a fortune 500, 300, and then for you to go up from there. I was like, what if I don't want to make money? What if that was, and she's like, what, we don't have anything for you here. You should rethink your life. Like it was just backwards to the world, right? Maybe it's not that for you. Maybe it's going to live on the mission field full time, but maybe it's not vocation related. Maybe it is. Maybe it's choosing to be a stay-at-home mom when the world tells you that that is backwards and lesser. 
Maybe it's breaking up with that guy who seems like a great guy, but you know he's not a Christian. He's not going to lead you and your future family towards Jesus, but further away from him. What's that next step? Whatever it is, there's a good chance the world is just not going to understand it. And Paul tells the Corinthian church why. 1 Corinthians 2. The person without the Spirit does not receive what comes from God's Spirit because it's foolishness to him. He's not able to understand it. Why? Because it's evaluated spiritually. You're not going to be able to discern and follow God's calling on your life through the world's wisdom. That's just not how it goes. It comes by the Spirit, which is why. Which is why you need some godly brothers and sisters when you're trying to figure out, is this my Red Sea moment? Because then the question starts to be, all right, well, how do I know if God is calling me to turn back and go part by the Red Sea? I'm going to give you real quick three things, just kind of a little aside that I've seen over and over again. Three things to figure out is God calling you to that. That, And I don't know why it's always three. It's because I'm a Baptist preacher, okay? I can't get past this. But first one is the conviction of the Holy Spirit, which means you've prayed and you've fasted over this and you feel like God is leading you there. Secondly, it's consistent with God's word. He's never going to call you to do anything that would be in contradiction uh, or against his word. And thirdly, godly counsel around you affirms it, right? You get those three things and you are probably headed in a good direction, which is why, by the way, even the way I lead Mercy Church is I lead with a group of elders, right? When I sense God calling us somewhere, it's through prayer and fasting. Is it faithful to God's word? And then I take it to a group of elders. And sometimes over the course of our years together, sometimes they've said, no, man, that's, I don't think that's where we need to go. And other times they've said, oh, we didn't really expect that was going to be the direction, but that seems like where God's taking us. You're going to need to have that group. And all that to say, don't disregard what God might be calling you to because it doesn't fit the world's plan for your life. Because here's the thing, think about Israel. It may be that the step that seems backwards to the world, that step might lead you to the greatest thing you've ever seen him do in your life. And maybe something that generations after now will look back and talk about the faithfulness of God in. And what he calls you to, he'll see you through. I mean, after all, we follow Jesus. His whole purpose made no sense to the world. He, I mean, God comes to earth. The king of kings goes up on a cross and dies. The gospel says the one without sin went and died for the sins of others. How backwards is that to the world? It's why they mocked him on the cross. Surely he can come down if he really is who he says he is. They couldn't believe he really was God if he's allowing this to happen. He rises up out of the grave, again, defying worldly wisdom. If the world doesn't understand Jesus, he will, it will not understand his followers. Now, next verse, he tells them why he's doing this. God tells them why he's doing all this. Look at this. God says, I will harden Pharaoh's heart so that he'll pursue them. Then, here's why, I will receive glory by means of Pharaoh and all his army. And two, the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. So the Israelites did this. Why did God choose to deliver them this roundabout way? Why not let them just keep going on the path they're on? Two reasons. He gets glory. More people know who he is. And I promise you, those are two results he has in mind with whatever he's calling you to. He gets glory. More people know who he is. When it comes to God's purpose in your life, there are two things at the center, worship and mission. Worship is you choosing to obey God with your life. Worship, I don't know if you're newer, worship is not just the singing portion of the church service, okay? Worship is all of life, Romans 12, 1 tells us. Worship is all of life. It's choosing to obey God. And as you choose to obey God, that's worship. When you explain to others why you're doing it, that's mission. Worship and mission. All right, let's keep going. Verse 5, when the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, Pharaoh and his officials changed their minds about the people. Oh, by the way, king of Egypt and Pharaoh are the same people, okay? Moses is using those interchangeably. It's the same person. They changed their minds about the people and said, what have we done? We've released Israel from serving us. So he got, got his chariot ready, took his troops with him. He took 600 of the best chariots and all the rest of the chariots of Egypt with officers in each one. The Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, just like he said he would. And he pursued the Israelites who were going out defiantly. That's the Israelites defying Pharaoh, going out. Verse 9, the Egyptians, all Pharaoh's horses and chariots, all the king's men, his horsemen and his army, chased after them and caught up with them as they camped by the sea beside Pihahirath in front of Baal Zephon. Here's what I want to say. The God that brought you out of Egypt is still your only hope when Egypt starts coming back after you. 
Y'all, Egypt's not going quietly into the night. Right? Egypt's not going down without a fight. And the God who delivered you out is still your only hope. Think about the sin in your life that God saved you from when you became a Christian, but it still wants to keep knocking at the door. I think this is why God is doing this the way he is with Israel, to remind them that the same one they depended on at the Passover is the only hope they have now and the only hope they will ever have. And the same is true for you and I. So much, um, or I guess a common problem I see with Christians is they think that they're supposed to grow beyond the gospel instead of deeper into it. You're not supposed to grow beyond the amazing saving work of God, you're supposed to go deeper into it, see more of how dependent you are on God for everything. And that's your salvation coming back. He's keeping that in front of them. All right, verse 10. As Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up. And by the way, Moses does a lot with the, look at the language around sight in this section. We'll go 10 through 12. As Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up and there were the Egyptians coming after them. The Israelites were terrified, cried out to the Lord for help. They said to Moses, is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you've taken us away to die in the wilderness? (laughs) What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Isn't this what we told you in Egypt? Leave us alone so that we may serve the Egyptians. It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. Oh, man. I told you what makes Exodus so powerful for us is how relatable Israel is. Uh, Verse 8, we're going out defiantly. Verse 10, we are terrified. (laughs) Listen to me. How quickly new trials erase the memory of God's past faithfulness. Have you experienced that? They see what's happening. They're seeing the wrong thing. They look at the Red Sea and they see, I realize I'm saying sea with two different things now. They see a grave where they should be seeing a staging area for God's greatest work he's ever done. They see a grave. But it will be, oh man, it will be through what they see as a grave that God will bring victory. What they see as a grave is actually God's path to life. So Moses says, you're going to have to change your sight. Moses said to the people, don't be afraid. Stand firm and see the Lord's salvation. When you look there, you need to see the Lord's salvation that he'll accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. And what do you need to do right now? You must be quiet. This is the first holy, shut your mouth, right? That's ever happened right here in Exodus. Just watch, see the Lord's salvation. See the enemy for the last time. The Lord who delivered you will fight for you. Y'all, this gets into that Second thing I want to talk about today about freedom, true freedom, God saves us to. Because what I want you to see is Israel's been liberated, but they don't seem like a free people, do they? Actually, they're a mess. They're full of fear, full of doubt. Uh, They're misremembering things. Oh, man, you want to talk about, tell me if you've ever done this. Like when they say, didn't we tell you it's better for us to be in Egypt? No. That's what Moses should have done. He should have said, nope. That's not what you said. In fact, Exodus 4, when I came in and Aaron told you everything that God told me, you said, awesome, we're with you. And we had a whole big prayer time gathering and everything else, worship service about it, right? But they're misremembering this because in their time of fear, their current fear starts to reshape how they remember the past faithfulness of God. Um, And even their own participation in it. That's because it's while their circumstance has changed, their focus, their sight has not. Their sight is still on self-preservation. And they're still dominated by fear. They're still focused on the way of escape instead of focusing on the Lord. So though they seem free, they are in fact still slaves. And it leads me to saying, listen, true freedom, true freedom is recognizing God saves us from sin, but also for him. He saves us from sin, but he also saves us for him. The Israelites are in this place right now where they've been delivered from Egypt, but they've not yet arrived to the mountain where they'll worship God. And when Moses goes to Pharaoh and demands the release of Israel, the famous line that we all remember, right? If you've got any sort of Bible background or anything, it's like you remember, or maybe you remember the song, Pharaoh, Pharaoh, oh, Pharaoh, let my people go, right? Ah, yeah, 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 you know, that whole thing. But we remember it as Pharaoh let my people go. 
that's not the line. Exodus 8.1, the Lord tells Moses what to say. He repeats it exactly. The Lord said to Moses, go into Pharaoh and tell him, this is what the Lord says, let my people go so that they may worship me. The Israelites weren't just saved from something, but were saved for something, to worship the Lord. And that right there is the difference between true freedom and the false freedom this world is parroting at you. I want to show you something I heard Tim Keller say uh, years ago about this passage. I think it's still absolutely relevant here and now. He said there's a couple of myths about freedom, but both kind of with this idea of what God saves you from, but just out in the middle of nowhere. Here's what he says. One myth is that freedom is complete independence from anything, from any authority. This is the modern definition of freedom, right? Nobody is my authority. True freedom is me and my personal experience are my authority. That's freedom, but it's just a myth. And Israel is a great example. They're free from Egypt, technically. They're not to the mountain yet, right, where they get God's law, so not under his law yet. And here they are. They're out, a totally free people, and yet they're enslaved to their fear. Left up to themselves, they're just going to do whatever fear tells them to do. And the reality is, if it wasn't fear, it'd be something else. And here's the reason, and if you're newer to church Christianity, you may not like this, but it is just a human truth. God designed us this way. We humans are designed to serve something besides ourselves. This is true. We are designed to serve something besides ourselves. So we will worship or serve something. We'll make up little gods to worship. All right, it doesn't matter who you are. The great American theologian Bob Dylan said it this way. It may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you're going to have to serve somebody. If you're like, is that a theologian? Look, you just need to do some homework, okay? I'm just saying, when you find a place where Bob Dylan and the Bible agree, you should look into it, all right? Everybody, what he's getting at is, what's just human truth, everybody lives for something. And whatever you live for will ultimately control you. And then unless it is God, unless it is Jesus, it will ultimately eventually disappoint you. The dreams you strive for, they become the, the dreams that you have to maintain and deal with and hassle with. Right? Some of you prayed forever for Prince Charming and you wound up with Prince changes his mind all the time, right? And you're like, man, I thought that was going to be one thing. Turns out it's not. You live for relationships. You're always seeking one. And if you're in one, you're nervous about what's going to sabotage it. You live for money. You're always looking for a little bit more. And you're angry and bitter constantly when you don't get enough of it. You're going to live for something. For those of you that like math equations, help make things really clear. When I say live for something, what that means is worship. To live for something is to worship it. And the only thing you can live for that won't disappoint you and consume you at the same time is Jesus, because you were made to live for him. It's only when God's people live for him that they flourish. Here's the second myth. The first myth is around no authority. <laughs> the second one, freedom means doing whatever I want. That's freedom. Freedom is nobody tells me what to do, and freedom is doing whatever I want to do. That's not true either. Freedom is not doing whatever you want. Freedom is doing what you're made to do. This is the problem that Disney has left imprinted on at least two generations. All right? Disney's motto, follow your heart. And then that's defended with, hey, man, after all, the heart wants what it wants, so follow your heart. The problem is my heart wants all kinds of things that are really bad for me. Right? Like, always, my heart wants steak and potatoes and mint chocolate chip ice cream. That's always what my heart wants. My heart wants me to sit on the couch with those things, watch the Olympics live, and then watch the replay at night with Mike Tirico and the primetime Paris thing, right? That's what my heart wants. Does that make me free when I do those things? No. It clogs my arteries and shortens my life expectancy, right? I become a slave to my appetites and leisure, and ultimately they destroy me. I wouldn't be able to... (laughs) to get up off the couch to play with my kids or see, even see my grandkids. How is that freedom? It's not. It's a myth. Freedom is not just doing whatever I want. It's doing what I'm made to do, to worship the Lord with my whole life, and there I'll flourish. The Israelites flourish not just by leaving Egypt and being under no authority and doing whatever they want, but when they give their whole lives to worshiping the Lord because they're not just saved from something but to something. You need to see that I pause and I give this much time in a sermon to those two myths because 
they are coming at you loud through all the channels with which you take input. That message is coming at you that that's what freedom is, and they're lies. No, it's freedom is salvation from the thing that enslaves you, sin, and the opportunity to worship God, to do what you're made to do. Okay, with that said, here's the moment. This is this iconic moment that we've been building towards, starting in verse 15, and it's so big. I just want to read it for you. I'm going to read verses 15 through 28, and we'll talk about it for just a second, okay? This is, this is awesome. All right, here we go. The Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to break camp. As for you, lift up your staff, stretch out your hand over the sea, and divide it so the Israelites can go through the sea on dry ground. As for me, I'm going to harden the hearts of the Egyptians, just like he said he would, so they'll go in after them, and I'll receive glory by means of Pharaoh, all his army, and his chariots and horsemen. God's after his glory. The Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I receive glory through Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. So then the angel of God told you about this earlier. The angel of God who was going in front of the Israelite forces moved and went behind them. The pillar of cloud moved from in front of them and stood behind them. It came between the Egyptian and Israelite forces. There was cloud and darkness. It lit up the night. And neither group came near the other all night long. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. The Lord drove the sea back with a powerful east wind all that night and turned the sea into dry land. So the waters were divided. And the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with the waters like a wall to them on their right and on their left. The Egyptians set out in pursuit. All Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, his horsemen went into the sea after them. During the morning watch, the Lord looked down at the Egyptian forces from the pillar of fire and cloud and threw the Egyptian forces into confusion. He caused their chariot wheels to swerve and made them drive with difficulty. Let's get away from Israel, the Egyptians said, because the Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea so the water may come back on the Egyptians, on their chariots and horsemen. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and at daybreak, the sea returned to its normal depth. While the Egyptians were trying to escape from it, the Lord threw them into the sea. The water came back and covered the chariots and horsemen, plus the entire army of Pharaoh that had gone after them into the sea. Not even one of them survived. Wow. What a moment, right? Let's look at how God saved them, because this is the example we're supposed to look back to. One moment think, I got to catch this, one moment they're about to die. The next moment, a man lifts up his hands and makes a way. The Lord's angel, the Lord's pillar, which represents that pillar of cloud and fire representing his presence, moves between his people and their enemy. And then the Lord turns the watery grave into the path of life. He makes the way, and all Israel has to do is walk. I want you to go there in your mind's eye, okay? Just to, just to put, you, put there a picture in your eyes, best you can. Two giant walls of water, it says, on either side. And the Lord does all of it. So great. All they had to do was walk. It wasn't the quality of their faith that saved them. It was the object of their faith that saved them. Like, think about who's going through Two million people, I can only imagine, this is just a little, just hypothesizing for a second, right? You got some that are going through that are just, I mean, they're pumped, they're dancing, they're happy, you know, little kids are going over to the wall of water like, bleep, you know, trying to touch and everything, whatever, right? You got some that are really having a blast going through, you got others that are probably with some doubt. I wonder if this thing's going to come crashing in. It doesn't matter, right? All they had to do was walk. It wasn't the quality of their faith that held the walls of water up. It was the object of their faith. It was God's love and power, not the quality of their faith. And some of you need to hear that today. As you're trusting God, but you feel like you're walking with kind of some shaky steps, you just keep your eyes fixed on the author and perfecter of your faith, Hebrews says. It's not the quality of your faith. It's the object of it. There's no question God saved Israel. I mean, they were bound for death, but God's servant lifted up his hands and the grave became the path to life. And in one moment, the distance between them and their enemies was an ocean. Y'all, how did God save Israel? Permanently and completely in one decisive act. How does he save us? Permanently and completely in one decisive act. Christianity is so clear on this. 
We do not believe salvation is a process. Now, growing in our understanding of salvation, yeah, for sure, that's a process. But the scriptures teach us that when Jesus got up on the cross, his one decisive act, he goes up on the cross for you and for me. He raised up his hands and made a way where there was no way. When he did that, and when you believe that he did that for your sins, God saves you permanently and completely. That's what Romans tells us. This is the message of faith we proclaim. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, if you believe, if you just walk, you will be saved. Jesus said on the cross, it is finished. You can't add to his work. All you can do is walk. It's just belief. And when he saves you, he puts, I need you to hear this, an ocean between you and your previous master called sin. He does not barely save you. All right, this isn't the Olympics where God saves you from sin by one one hundredth of a second. No. He drowns your previous master and puts him at the bottom of the ocean. And the previous land you lived in, there's an ocean between you and that now. What a victory. And can you sit on that for a second? Those of you going through a cycle of sin and you feel like sin is still just right there and you can't break away from it, you keep going back to it. I just need you to hear that if you're in Christ, you are not enslaved to that sin anymore. That sin does not run your life. That sin does not have authority over your life. God put that thing at the bottom of the ocean. Romans 6, we know that our old self was crucified with him, Jesus, so that the body that once was ruled by sin might be rendered powerless, bottom of the ocean. So we may no longer be enslaved to sin because it's at the bottom of the ocean. Since a person who has died is freed from sin. And if we died with Christ, we believe we'll also live with him. Therefore, if anyone, Paul says in 2 Corinthians, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Where's the old? Passed away, gone, and see, look, the new has come. And Jesus says it really simply. If the Son sets you free, you'll be free indeed. If you have walked through the watery grave on the dry land path made for you by Jesus Christ's outstretched arms, then you are free. You're free. Would you walk free today? I'm going to give us a time to respond. I want to do so in a time of prayer. Our worship team's going to come and, and they're going to get in place, kind of help lead us through this. But I want it to be a time of prayer and response. And here's what I was thinking. I grew up going to a, um, a little old Baptist church in Greensboro, North Carolina. And it was one of these where there were two rows of these things called pews. Okay. These are benches with cushions, right? They were just kind of lining the room. And in the middle was an aisle. And I was thinking about it this week. We often, the preacher would often say, hey, some of you need to walk the aisle and come down. And maybe it's give your life to Christ. Maybe it's confess something in your life. Maybe it's ask God for help. Whatever it is, you need to respond to God. He would often say, you need to do business with the Lord, right? And I was thinking about that as I was prepping the sermon this week is the aisle is, it's, just, it's a metaphor in many ways of the path that Israel walked, right? Walking through all they did was, it was not the quality of their faith, the quality of their steps, it was the object of their faith. They had their sights fixed on Christ. And maybe today that needs to be you, to give your life to the Lord, to give over to the Lord something that's been dominating your life, confess something to the Lord, just seek the Lord's help. I'm going to tell you, we often call the front of the stage the altar, okay? And maybe you need to walk the aisle and come and kneel before the Lord as our worship team comes up here and sort of sets that stage for us so that we can respond. I want you to feel the freedom to do that. Let's go ahead. Let's get into a posture of prayer now, and you guys can, can come up. Here's how I want you to pray. First, I want you to hear me say the altar's open again. I want to say that. And secondly, maybe as, even as you're sitting there, maybe you need to let your body posture, we often say this, guide your heart posture, Maybe that's opening your hands physically like you're out before the Lord, releasing as you do that, whatever it is that may be that thing that you have lived for, that you have worshiped and you maybe not have, didn't even realize that's what you're doing, but that's what it was. And maybe as your hands are open and you're laying that down to him, would you receive the Lord's presence again? He's with you, but again, it's symbolically saying, God, I, I receive you as my first love, you as the authority that when I obey you, I flourish, and I receive that today. If you're not a Christian, I invite you to receive salvation. 
which is as simple as right there, hands open before the Lord saying, God, I believe that I, I am a sinner. Apart from you, I'm stuck at the Red Sea, and that sin that has always had me is coming back for me again. But I believe Jesus made a way. He died on the cross for my sins, and in doing so, he even says he is the way. I believe his death gives me forgiveness of my sins. I believe he rose again. And I believe I, I have new life in his resurrection. You tell him, thank you, God, for saving me. As you're in a posture of prayer, as this room is in a posture of prayer, the altar is going to be open. We're going to keep this time of response open for a little bit. You pray and respond as God leads. Cause walls to fall with your power. Perform miracles. There is nothing that's impossible. And we're standing here only because you made. You move a mountain. You cause walls to fall with your power. Perform miracles. There is nothing that's impossible. And we're standing here only because you made. And we're standing here only always runs out.
a testimony this morning, right? All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. What's our response? With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. Let's pray. God, we praise you for this morning. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for going before us. Thank you for conquering death so that we didn't have to. And thank you for the life change that we get to walk out of here celebrating yet again on another Sunday. As we go into our work weeks, Lord, would you go before us? Would you be in us? Would you live through us? We love you. We give this time to you in your name we pray. Amen. Well, Mercy Church, before I send you out, can we just thank our band really quick? This, this band is entirely uh, volunteer team members this morning. And a special shout out to Casey visiting us from our Mercy Northeast campus. Thank you for being here. I didn't tell them I was going to do that. So, you know, we love our band. They're awesome and, and gifted. And they lead us into worship. And so praise God for you guys. Um, all right, before I send you out, quick reminder, if you're in the room and you haven't been at Starting Point yet, it is happening after this service, right out those doors by the bathrooms, down the hall, first door on the left. We'd love to see you there. And in normal mercy fashion, before I send you out, I'm going to read a blessing over you. This is our benediction. And these words come from the book of Numbers, and these are the words that God told Moses to instruct the priests of Israel to use to bless the people of Israel. For generations and generations, these words have been spoken as a blessing, and so I want to speak them over you. So if you want to open your hands up as a way of just symbolizing that these are God's words for you to bless you and, and, and go out in this blessing. This comes from Numbers chapter 6, verse 24. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look with favor on you and give you peace. Mercy Church, in that blessing, you are sent.